And uh, without further ado, let's get the panelists up here. Uh, because one of the great things about being a moderator of the panelists that we have here with us today is the fact that uh, they have the genius. They have every single bit of the knowledge you want to have, and they're really here for your Q&A. Before, or as they come up here, so panelists, I'd like you to walk up here now uh, and get in your positions. The one thing I would love for you to do now, rather than at the end, is start formulating some questions, because we're talking about curriculum design and course design. And because I, lo I know that the brain loves novelty, I'm, rather than going to uh, introduce each person myself, I'm going to let each person introduce themselves and take about 30 seconds to do so. And that way we get the emphasis where it's supposed to be, the names pronounced as they should be, and the full intent of what the panel will be. So <laughs> we'll start with the gentleman on my left. My name's Joe. Uh, Joe Drews. I run a company called Drews Multimedia. I help. Uh, I help them review and revamp uh, a lot of their learning and development programs to help get away from the age-old complaints of this is the way we've always done it. Thank you very much, Joe. And to your left. Kira, I'm Sheila Larson. Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 I'm Sheila Larson. <laughs> I'm the director for Pacific. I'm the director for Pacific Heritage Academy. We're a charter school that's trying to re-innovate and re-imagine how we do learning by really looking at what the students are doing. A lot of our presenters have already talked about experiential learning and that's what we're doing in our school. We want to really instill the fundamentals of knowing who you are and why you're there and where you're going and be confident in learning. I always tell our kids that you can stand on the top of the ice. Um, what's the building you have? Empire State Building. Thank you. From New Zealand. Still learning about mountains and towers. Um, so you can stand on the Empire State Building and say and be confident who you are. And you can be who you want to be and know that you can do it and have the confidence to do so. Demetria White and I am the Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Research at Tougaloo College. But I bring a background that's in mathematics and computer science. Uh, I love working with students, uh, particularly uh, impacting girls to be interested in the sciences. Uh, I have a passion for coding now, since that's one of the emerging fields, and also online learning. So uh, I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Brian Grass. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Technology for a school district in Northeast Ohio. I bring uh, 20 years of experience in the education field, 10 as an administrator and 10 as a classroom teacher where I taught language arts, math, and world languages. Um, I'm also a faculty member at two universities in our area where I work with uh, educational leaders on doing data analytics in their classrooms as well as in their schools. So I'm, I'm really excited to share thoughts with you guys today. <laughs> oh, can you? Uh, my name is Robin Shannon, and I am the co-founder of two uh, public charter schools in South Los Angeles. Um, I started my career in education way back in the 80s, and um, I promised the families in that area that I would return. And so in 2008, I returned and with another couple started the schools. Uh, we're STEM focused, which is interesting because we became the first school in South LA to offer uh, computer science and also to do AP environmental science. And so one of the things that we try to get our students to see is even though you may be have been born and raised in South LA, it does not mean that you have to carry that stigma with you all your life. And there is absolutely nothing that you cannot do if you put your mind to it. So I'm known as Mother Shannon by a group of students. As I visit them at the university level, and I'm very proud of what my students are doing. Thank you. And thank you. So we're going to start things out. It's not going to be round robin, so in a raise your hand way. But because this has been a pretty interesting couple of years, and this field has changed dramatically, 
how are you approaching curriculum design or course design today? And we can start with whoever types up first. Uh, I think that was a big reason when, when a couple years ago, when kind of everything changed and moving a lot of the curriculum into an online kind of digital world. And I was working with a company who was moving everything from instructor training all the way into Zoom training. So they had to do it within two weeks. And to change that whole curriculum was a, was a lot of work and thinking about how that process would change and how it looks different and how it would interact differently and how to keep the cameras on and things like that. And how to do all those things when it comes to moving everything into the digital world. And one of the things that I found is there really isn't a lot of difference, and the main thing for me and what I work with companies and work with a lot of people on is to create a multifaceted approach. It's not just one way. One, 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 one instructor in their class isn't just going to do it. One course isn't just going to do it. There's a lot of different methods that we all have to institute for different people, different businesses, different learning styles, you know, all that. So, yeah. Mother Shannon, you said that you were going up your face to the microphone. <laughs> So, um, your question again about you know the change that we've had with the Zoom and stuff. I think we were rather fortunate in some ways because we had already started doing things. We were one to one in our high school, and we had the technology we needed in our middle and elementary school. And our teachers were pretty resilient when it came to this. Plus, that's when I got to be Mother Shannon. And so when they had to go home with things, and the post office knows me real well because we started mailing supplies, so that a lot of our hand-on things never really stopped happening because we just dug deep and asked donors, and so we did what we needed to do. So I think one of the things after listening to all presenters, and um, I think one of the big scare happened was when people were thrust into a world they did not know. But what we have to realize is students knew this world. And some things we thought students couldn't do, they knew better than we. So when it came to Zoom and everything else, it was the students, it was the students that were telling the teachers, no, you push this button, so I can see you, or so I can't see you. And it was more the teachers. So I think this became a reverse, which I think was very, very good. So if we hold on to that reverse, where we allowed the students to be the teachers for a while and not be afraid of letting that happen, I think education is going to have a chance to make a pretty good switch. <laughs> what, what, you know, to follow up on that, what, what kind of differences have you seen? I mean, because again, you had the students take over, and a lot of nods when you said that. It was surprising, and it sounded like it uplifted the experience. Yeah. I, I, I think it was, it seeing the teachers back on campus this year, a lot of them did not go back to the old. They stuck with the new, which is really good to see. Um, teachers, there's more reading going on, but the students choose what to read, when to read. There's a lot of them that are still using a lot of technology, and everybody is kind of really, I think, happy with what's happening uh, right now. So I, I think it did a lot. We were doing a lot of social emotional things, and one of the things that I had fun with doing the year before the pandemic, I said when I retired, I wanted to go back into the classroom for a year because I'm a computer scientist, engineering scientist person. And so I did, and then the pandemic hit me in March. And then so the year of the pandemic, I pushed stuff out and still taught. And this year being back in the classroom, I put social emotional learning into my lesson plans, as have the teachers. So one of our fun things is the quick write. And the other day, one of my quick writes was, if you could be anywhere in the world right now, where would you be and why? And you cannot see, say home in bed. It's amazing the places the students said they wanted to be. I mean, you know, one young lady says, I, I want to go to Madagascar and see the Lemurs because I've seen movies with them on there. And I'm going, wow, that's a long way from South LA. So it's amazing what the kids will do if you allow them to do. But as long as we squelch them down, they're not going to do that. I, I would like to look at it from another perspective. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. One of the things pre-COVID, uh, and others may have experienced this, so we were working on a platform, if you're familiar with Moodle, and people thought that I was just married to Moodle, but I wasn't. We were just at a point where things were working, and administrators wanted to use Candice. Well, we were in the middle of having to use two systems, COVID kids, train your faculty, don't use Zoom, so I want to use Zoom, but uh, train them on Microsoft Teams because now we're switching to 
365. So we have all of this in the mail that's going on. Okay. COVID. Now we're in the midst of COVID. So I want to just kind of step back and look at it from an assessment point of view because what did we realize we didn't have our unreadiness and how prepared are we now? We assumed that we could work in a virtual environment, that students have the computers, they have the internet. Then you force faculty, staff to use their own devices, so using my data plan for me to be effective, et cetera, et cetera. Then how are the students really learning in the online environment? What do we really need to change? What do we need to keep? Do we need to go hybrid? So, you know, for me now, uh, and we did an assessment uh, online, how were the students engage in online learning? And it was not surprising that the seasoned faculty that were resistant to change had the worst evaluations. Because now, we're a private college, we have I don't know, I want to say that word. Mm -hmm. You have not provided quality service to, to that customer, and you have ripped them and stolen from them because now they didn't get educated like they should have. We've lacked in those areas. So one of the things we are looking at is kind of looking at that and doing the assessments, and not only just looking at the data, but making use of the results to be more effective. And my daughter teaches high school, and I just really wanted to share that. She said, I am, you know, we sit back, and then you have these Zoom issues because there's an invasion of privacy. We, we saw that around the nation where there are things going on in the background. So now you're dealing with should the camera be on, should it be off, those kinds of things. So it caused us to step back and look at really we need to clean up that piece of technology. I didn't mean to say, that's, that's just a passion of mine. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> With, okay, yeah, that's good, but, but I'm just going to come. Thank you. So I want to connect to what both of you said here because it represents my world in a nutshell. Um, as the guru in technology in the district, I don't know why I had that hat, that hat. I know not to be dangerous at the end of the day, but no more than that. I experienced what you experienced when you were going through that and changing systems and all of that. But in the same regard, I also experienced what you were going with and going back to the values. And I think that's what where we have to change as a society going forward. I think of what I ask my teachers to do on a regular basis. Basis. We ask them to go ahead, unpack their standards, how I many of you have heard that before, unpack them, teach to them, and then everything's going to be fine from there. That's great, but then I look at what we saw this morning and I look at what I have posted on every classroom in every single room in our district. We have this glorified mission statement that says we expose these values. And what the pandemic enlightened for us is that even though we said we want students to be critical thinkers, we want them to be civic engaged, I couldn't point to a single spot in the curriculum, K through 12, of where we were actually doing that. And so my charge now has been to, to engage our faculty in this way. We're still gonna meet state standards because what we like it or not, there are requirements we have to meet. But now we're going to infuse those things into it. So one of the things I've taken from our experience with the technology piece is we've got some technology integration running every grade level, K through 12, every unit of study. We uh, value uh, experiential experiences is what we title it in our mission statement. What does that really mean? I'm not quite sure right now as I sit here, but I'm having teachers define that and point to me in your course, where are you doing that? So we can ga uh, you know, gather some data on that and report out on them because we're saying to our taxpayers and to our citizens, when you leave our district, your kid is going to be able to do this, this, and this. Now prove it and play it up. And I think that's where we're seeing in my region of the country, a lot of people are starting to go back to what those values are and how are we actually teaching for them and how are we planning for them. You guys still want to weigh in on that? Sheena? Just to piggyback what you're all saying, um, I've had an experience that I've worked with the highs of the highs, the best in Hawaii, worked with Robert um, over in Hawaii with the community schools. Private school, you know, have they have the best of the education and then I've chosen to come to a Title I school. Issues with technology are huge. Issues with family, societal issues are huge. But you know, when we look at values, and that's what I want to have a look, um, kind of attach my hat to, the values of teaching has to be planned according to who you're teaching. So if you're teaching a child that has, as a home, you know, just wrecked, they don't have a home to go to, they're perhaps undocumented, or they've got some 
other huge issues that they're facing in their life, how, uh, as teachers, are we able to teach them? Will we give them a safe place? We look at values. We look at what their strengths are. So as you're planning your curriculum, you've got to know your kids first. You've got to know, can they read? Do they have a light at home to do homework? Is homework valued? So again, you know, um, we do this in our school and we're looking at unpacking standards. We're looking at connecting that to our curriculum. How are we assessing them? But how do we intentionally infuse engagement activities to check for understanding and checking all the time because we know our kids. We know that they transpose things or they're um, struggling with numbers. If we know that, we can intentionally create our own curriculum and plan it that way. You will find success because the relationship is there. With the teachers, no one cares. You know, we we'll all hear that saying, right? The kids won't care until the teachers care or they know that you care. You know what I'm talking about. But Rita Pearson is one of my favorite people. Because when she talks about uh, caring for a kid and you're putting your actress face on and your actor face on, that means that you're really caring about the kid enough to know where their learning journey is, their learning progression is. That to me is one of the most important and vital things that we have to teach our teachers to teach in their curriculum. Thank Bravo. you. Very, very nice. Yeah. Question for each one of you, and we'll start with Joe and just go straight down the line. For two years ago, we're back to today, and you're looking at your job. What did you already know, but now see in a different light? I think I knew that going uh, digital was the way to go. I think that was the multi multifaceted approach that I was taking already. Uh, I think I see in a different light today of what that looks like, on how that, what that looks like on adults, what that looks like on children, I see a lot of with my kids going through a lot of the digital learning, whether it's online learning or live through Zoom or recorded videos, anything like that, moving into more of a, a different approach that way. So a lot of different methods. With adults, when I move into adults, it's uh, very similar in that way of giving them lots of different access to what they need to learn, whatever subject they need to learn on, whether that's considered uh, tiny learning or what's that, what's the word, micro learning, <laughs> the, the, the phrase, uh, micro, whether that's micro learning, animated videos, something that people can access at any time. Just in time learning is another big one that you learn here about. So just things that they can access and have available to them when they need it, rather than you know waiting for them to get it from an instructor or a supervisor or a teacher, being able to access it when they need it and how they, and how they can access it is easy. Thank you, Joe. Sheena? Can you repeat the question? Because I get lost in your answer and it's so good that I might want to jump on that. So, from two years ago to today, what did you already know but now see differently? The importance of technology. I feel like I'm in a Miss Universe answer. <laughs> Miss Dean. Um, just understanding the use of technology. Knowing that what we didn't have two years ago, we now know have, has kind of um, propelled us into the 21st century, whether we liked it or not. It also helped us to understand that we've got to teach our kids to be ethical users of technology. We've got to be ethical users of technology and be the role model for it. We've got to learn and appreciate what technology can do for us. The other thing I, I think I learned, and um, as we moved into an online digital world that we were prepared for, is that um, we had to be even more entertaining. <laughs> that our kids are very self-gratification, right? The instant gratification, they gotta have that right then and there. But with the, the technology piece, videos and, oh, you know, we weren't able to explain it um, as much as the kids needed to interact with it. So we had to step up our game not knowing how to do that, but figuring it out with the PLCs that we'd create amongst each other and anybody that would listen to us and say, hey, we need help. Um, but it was a difficult journey for us because our kids didn't have the technology and we didn't have the, the resources to be able to provide them for it. But I, did, I do think that as we come back, and like our panelists have said, 
Our teachers' teaching has become more 21st century. And we've stepped up to the plate. We've, um, have you all seen that trust fall? Where you fall forward, you fall back, and the little girl falls forward, and someone's standing at the back of you trying to catch them, and they fall in their face. We've done that a number of times. And that's really showing our kids that you've got to be resilient through this learning journey. And it's not going to stop. We all fail. And we heard that this morning. But we fail forward. And we teach the kids perseverance. Whether it's, I can't get in. My login doesn't let me get in. Or, you know, my computer's broken. Or my little sister put milk in it. You know, we hear all of those things. But um, from two years ago, I think we've learned so much. Um, and we've stepped up to the plate. We're not perfect, but we're there, getting there. Fantastic. Dimitri, same question. I think um, just waking up overnight, we realize that we're catching up with ourselves. Uh, being in education and having uh, the technological tools, we're the leaders and not using it. Yet industry and in corporate America is using the tools more than we were. So we found ourselves having to catch up overnight, uh, which leads us to, you can't teach what you don't know, so you can't be a leader to teaching students and you're not prepared. So it forced that component that if I don't have the skill sets, I can't lead these students to these jobs that we're teaching a four-year curriculum or two, and by the time we finish the curriculum, it's outdated. And so having to meet those students and engage in the different skill sets of learners is going to be even more challenging. But I think uh, conferences like this is, is really helpful to hear new ideas and it's forcing others to kind of step out of their comfort zone to, you know, do I retire? Do I stay in this? It's not going to change. So I think it's really putting us in a better place in education to become facilitators of learning and not doing the show and tell, and allowing students to be more active in the classroom. Uh, someone said something this morning, and I started thinking back. I think it was 1981 in the Omni magazine. It was predicted that education would no longer be in existence. It's almost real now, right? And I heard someone say that, that we're on a trajectory to failure in the education, if we don't do something immediately. And I think one of the things that was even most, it's still challenging, is that uh, from an administrative leadership position, at the top, because there's so much bureaucracy in higher ed, that we have to have leaders who have a vision and can think quickly, because we don't, time is not on our side. And I just leave this note, what I have learned, uh, it takes 10 years for anything to change, particularly in higher ed. So if, okay, so two years, we're behind, so we have eight years for whatever we've been changing. So it's really causing us to really uh, come up with some solutions and work more collaboratively. So that's what I've learned. Brian, what did you already know and now see different? Ooh, I think I've got two parts to this question. So one is tying into what Joe said about the idea of differentiation, that we have to provide kids with multiple access points to whatever it is that we're teaching. But in the same regard, I think what I found, because I had some of my best teachers struggle immediately when we went virtual, and then I had some of my weakest teacher soar to the clouds as we were doing that. And what it came back to every single time was is it came back down to the pedagogy. If they're an expert in pedagogy, we can throw anything at them and they will soar with that. And for some of my people that struggled, we were relying on the lesson plan that was in the file cabinet for the last 20 years. And I think back to our simulation conversation that just happened here. That's an excellent example of what good pedagogy is. There's a motivating compactor, uh, factor in there. We think about uh, whoever the gentleman was this morning when he was talking about Madeline Hunter. Madeline Hunter had a specific pedagogy she used. I don't care which one it is, you just have to identify with, with one and use it to move the students forward. Barbara? So what I knew before was that teachers really weren't needed. And when I say that, when my children were young, I bought the Encyclopedia Britannica because everybody did. I sat and read it and they could have taught themselves anything they wanted to learn in the Encyclopedia Britannica. The only thing they needed me as a parent to do was to tell them when to go to bed and to close the book. 
What I learned with the pandemic is that's really true because everything the students need to know is either on Google, on someplace else, and we as teachers are the guides. No, that's not a good, go to another YouTube video. I don't think that's really telling you the truth. You need to go here. And so that's what I learned. So as was said earlier, we need to learn more to be guides, facilitators, and not figure that we know all the answers because as you were saying, the world is changing so fast that we don't know and we scramble to keep up. I go to conferences because I don't have time to read all the stuff anymore. I try to hit every science conference, everything in the world, and listen to speakers like, oh, okay, because I don't, because things are, are, are just, you know, zooming. And so that's what I know, what I knew, but now I definitely know. <laughs> Perfect. We've got two minutes left. Does anybody have a question for our panelists uh, before we hang it up? And yes, ma'am, uh, go ahead and come up to the microphone. And I also, before she says her, her question, I want to applaud you all because they, they talk about Education 2.0. And there's been a lot of speakers saying, oh, we need to change, but y'all are changing. Mm -hmm. and, and you're the change shifters, you're it. So give yourself a round of applause. I mean, that's a yeah, fabulous job. It's wonderful to hear this kind of stuff. Yes, ma'am, your question. Uh, thank you for your time and for sharing your experiences. Um, I just want to support that more than 30 years ago, uh, some of us were the young educators that said we have to do something different like this isn't working You know and we were the loud new teachers and now we're the school leaders and guess what we get to do something different And so I just really applaud those um, of us who are Continuing to move on and finally we get a shot and so let's take it um, and, and I really agree that we've moved, and this is a very technology-oriented conversation, and we've moved that ahead. Probably we moved education technology ahead three years and three months, right out, right out of the gate. And, um, but that has also exposed a lot of inequities that I think were able to not be talked about. They were enabled to be shoved aside, and we can't do that anymore. And so my question for the panel is, what's your go-to question when you're working with a teacher or a team, um, and you're reviewing their teaching and their materials through an equity lens? So what's your go-to question when you want to get through to that equity discussion with a, either an individual or with a teaching team? Thank you. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll, give a, I'll give an idea of what I've done in the past. It doesn't always work. You have to really know the person you're actually talking to to have this type of conversation. But I ask them this question. I ask them to describe their classroom for me. I have them close their eyes. And I want you to describe, tell me what you see, tell me what you hear the kids saying. And then I say, okay, now we're going to look at this material. Does that material represent the vision you just described in your classroom? If the answer is no, then we probably need to be looking at a different material. If the answer is yes, then we need to probe in a little bit more to find out how is that going to be used to guarantee equity across our classrooms. I think for me, from a corporate standpoint, I think one of the questions I always ask is, what are the learners, what do they feel about the current training? And I would say almost every corporation I've worked with does not know that answer. <laughs> they just kind of do the same old thing, and they don't actually talk to the learners about what they feel about it. So talking, that's one of my first questions. I think it's now, Barbara? Can everybody hear me? Can everybody hear? Oh, OK. All right. So um, I go a little bit further than you and the fact that first of all I share with my my teachers and other leaders the kind of student I was and the fact that you know if they had been putting labels on people a long time ago I would have had ADHD plus 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 and my teachers all knew that so when I stopped doing my work they would send me down to Mr. So-and-so's room to work or someplace else so I was always busy so I asked my teachers what kind of student were you and tell me what happened in some of your classrooms. Tell me what you would have liked to have seen happen in one of your classrooms. Now look at your lessons. Does that portray what you would like to have had a teacher do for you? And if it does not, how can we change that to make it look like that? And usually, ouch, well, I dropped the note. Work anyway, you're okay. <laughs> okay. 
usually usually that works for them and just the sharing of my experiences because they looking at me they couldn't figure that out but when I tell them that then it makes them look at everything from a whole different lens and to understand it's okay to do something different in my classroom if I can reach the students doing it that way and maybe if I can go to the little ones <laughs> seems like we're going right down that line um, when I think about it and teaching kids to their learning ability, I take away and I ask the teachers to just don't think about who they are, what they do, where they are, but look at what you're teaching, how you're teaching it and why. So if we're able to answer those three questions, as a teacher you ask the students that in their class the same three questions. What are you learning? How are you learning it? And why are you learning it? To go to the equity piece, that kind of levels the planning field. Because if a child can tell you why they're learning it, how they're learning it, what they're learning, you know they've learned it. Whether they've been, you know, they're low socioeconomic or they've got, uh, we don't do GPAs in elementary school, but a 4.0 GPO, GPA. So if they've got all A's and whatever, it's irrelevant because you start looking at them as a person, for, first and foremost, and that they've got a specific learning trajectory or progression that they need to go on. So if you're asking those three questions in your mind and you're asking the students, there's your verification back. You're on the right track. If I can talk to a teacher in that perspective through those lens, she'll be able to self oh, heal, she'll be able to self-diagnose their own um, maybe understanding or inequity of teaching. Fabulous. Dimitri. I'm going to talk to Ed quickly. Um, and, and having talk math, struggle with it and then teaching it. I think students uh, really appreciate that. Uh, the biggest challenge in working in those areas where students don't feel confident in is building the confidence. That's the 80% of it. So I would uh, start off when you say equity, so you have to always assess them and don't assume that they are learning just because the information has been delivered. So I would say don't ask questions like, I don't know, I don't understand. Be specific because we remember, like, I forgot. And so we would stop. So I would give a scenario, and it could work in different areas. The average eight-year-old knows and you don't know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's the body language. <laughs> so, you know, an eight-year-old will come and ask you a question, and if you don't give that answer in a few seconds, they start kind of moving back like, well, you know, in other words, they say, it's okay, just admit you don't know. Mm -hmm. So I would tell them, uh, you know, as part of the math class, make it careful for everyone, when we're learning each concept, to gauge their learning, I would ask them to explain it back to me. Right? Teach back. To make sure that they understood. And it would take students, regardless of their level, if they learn something, you know, how you measure that. And, and that really helped, helped with me uh, from that eight year old response. So I challenged my niece who had to take my college out of the class, repeat, she had to repeat it. And I was as hard on her as anyone else. I'm going to make a time. So I said, go home and tell your eight year old brother how to explain a function. He said, okay, take the coffee pot, right? You have to have water in it, you have to have the coffee, but in, in order to make it work, it has to have electricity. And then it starts going down in the container. You want to make sure it doesn't burn, so it has a on and off switch. Isn't that in our function? Yep. So go off the grid, use some real life application. Because if we don't help them to understand the learning outside, Thank you, Demetria. And thank you for your question. Thank you, Sheena, Joe, Brian, Barbara, your panel for Education 2.0. Thank you.